Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. And for the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here to Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. How you doing? Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. I'm glad there's not like, um, you know, that... Is there ever been when you go to the theater, you could actually smell what's going on? Because I just played hockey, man, and I... I haven't had, I kind of stink, I have to say, I haven't had a shower yet. It's probably too much information for the listeners. But I just uh, played a beer league game and mm-hmm. I got back and watched, I watched the full first period and then I went through the great A sh- uh, chances. So I, I full disclosure, uh, I, ha- I didn't watch the whole second and third period. I just watched the great A shots and, and went through those. So we'll be relying more on you tonight than on me, Bruce, for this okay. game recap. Although the game in, uh, in a lot of ways, it was over after the first period. Um, the owners did make a game of it, though. Came back and uh, put some pressure on. In their 4-3 to three loss to the Calgary Flames, in the it was going to be a massacre of Alberta, but it did turn into a battle of Alberta in the end. So, um, Bruce, um, we're going to get into the, we're going to get right into the terrible start of the owners. I'll, I'll just start with the four. You know, I'll start with my bad thing. So our two bad, two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. I just feel like starting with the bad thing tonight. And the thing that stuck out to me, I think it was Calgary's fourth goal. I'm just mm-hmm. from that, they just they just were letting in goal every which way but loose. You know, like every way you can screw up on a goal against, they were doing it. And then it got worse on the fourth goal against because. Cody Cece's line change on that one. And, and listen, I'm not just picking on Cody Cece here. Every player will have bad line changes now and then in the NHL. This is right near the top of the list, though, because he's so late in getting off the ice. And I, and I don't, I didn't see whether he could have moved quicker. Like he, sometimes, you know, get that replay where you can tell. But I, it, just from the way the play um, went, there seemed like there was time for him to get off the ice quicker. Yeah. Anyway, he was not off the ice, and Ryan Murray charges onto the ice, and immediately the puck's thrown his way, and he muffs it. Like, it goes goes kind of through him, um, and it's Kadri, I think, uh, who gets it and goes in. No, that um, was, this was the Mangiapane rebound. Go, oh, uh, but Kadri, Kadri was involved in the play. Yeah, but, didn't, he get, didn't he get it down the wing? Wasn't that him yeah, coming down the wing? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't know if he, I'm not mistaken. He undressed um, Yeah, Murray. anyway. Poor Murray is just caught out because, and he he also muffed the play. He lost the battle, yeah. and and in the slot, I mean, um, yes, Apuliarvi and Evan Bouchard just totally faded faded completely away from where the puck was going. Like they didn't mm-hmm. follow. They Puliarvi, like you know, he was he just wandered off. Bouchard was kind of wandering. They're both in the red light zone, not covering a man and not uh, covering a passing lane. And uh, it was just a horrible, it was a horrible goal against. But CeCe's play on that, that bad line change, like it's, and, and you know, the player himself will feel the worst about that. But that was just one horrible moment after another on, on the, in that particular sequence of pain. Yeah, well, CeCe was on the right side and of course the bench is on the left side. So he does have to go, you know, 85 feet more or less to get over there. But holy moly, David, the Oilers iced the puck down uh, and, uh, it, you know, cleared all the way down into Calgary's zone. They needed a change. And the camera followed the puck. And the clock was ticking down, ticking down, ticking down. Calgary sort of getting reset, reorganized in their own zone. It's not like the goalie came out and fired a 140-foot stretch pass to catch the line change. It took forever for Calgary to get out of their own zone. And finally, they got over center, and the camera catches up to the play. And here's CeCe still on the ice trying to dive over the boards. Well, where were you doing that like four or six seconds ago? Like, honestly, one of the slowest line changes I can remember seeing. Like, what are you doing out there, man? Hustle and, and to the bench. Smart player. Like a smart player, oh, positionally oh, oh, sound, oh, and he just blew that play. Yeah, it was a terrible play. And um, then Murray, Murray came out and uh, immediately got exposed by uh, by Kadri on the one-on-one. And then more problematic to me was that uh, 
Uh, uh, Campbell made the first save and the puck was there loose in the crease and Murray had a chance to clear it. Same thing happened in the Vancouver game where there's a puck kind of rattling around in the blue paint and it needed a, you know, a deft stick to clear it from danger and Murray on both occasions just simply failed to clear the puck and it wound up being a tap in. Bruce, if that, if that goal against was the question, mm -hmm. Marcus Niemelainen might be the answer. Oh. I think we're going to see, I, my bet is, after that game, we're going to see Marcus Niemelainen. And there's, there's something missing on the Oilers' defense right now. Mm -hmm. It's a little soft back there. It's called defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, I have to say, both, both times, the uh, first goal against Vancouver, the Patterson goal in the like, first minute or whatever it was on yeah. Wednesday night, and this one, where there was sort of, you know, an emergency in the blue paint and the puck didn't get cleared. And both times I, I asked myself, I wonder if Chris Russell would have got that puck out of danger. And both times I was going, yeah, probably you would have. Yeah. But uh, Ryan Murray didn't. And it's, it's, it's way, 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 way too early to, to uh, uh, you know, form a conclusion on the guy. But it's not too early to start a rap sheet. <laughs> and there's already a couple items on that rap sheet, from my point of view, and and uh, he needs to uh, uh, he needs to uh, uh, bring a little more on the defensive side of the game to, for uh, uh, for my liking. Like those goals wound up basically being gifts because no one could clear the puck, and it was just just a tap in. There's moments that I've liked. I liked him in the first game actually quite a bit, especially as the game went along. I thought he and Bouchard played well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they really didn't have that luxury. They were just ghastly, that pairing. And Murray, you know, we we tagged him on three of the first uh, four goals as a major culprit. And uh, the only one he wasn't was when poor poor Brett Kulak. <clears throat> Any, anyone who's ever played defense in their life shuddered mm -hmm. when they saw that play. Anyway, let's get on to your, you're going to cover that though. Let's, let's go to your bad thing here, which is these, oh. go ahead. Yeah, my bad thing is basically the first half of the first period when this yeah. game was lost by the Oilers. Uh, the second game in a row that they came out with an absolutely wretched opening few minutes, uh, both uh, Wednesday and Saturday, they were already down, uh, given allowed two goals by the first TV timeout. And then tonight they allowed two more by the second TV timeout. And then by then it was... Uh, time to pull the one goalie, bring in the other guy, and he came in and played great, but the deficit was too great. I mean, if they, they managed to somehow pull off a three-goal comeback against Vancouver. Well, you know you're not going to be able to do that every time. And on a night when Calgary Flames were the best defensive team, I believe, in the Western Conference last year, uh, and uh, uh, brought their checking game, didn't bring Jacob Markstrom, uh, who the Oilers victimized time and again last year, and uh, between the flames and what I saw as a wretched ice surface that didn't allow for any kind of clean puck handling or passing and got worse and worse as the game went on. But the, uh, um, uh, the flames were able to manage that puck better than the Oilers did. And uh, to me, they were, uh, you know, they were just winning every race puck battle, uh, decision-making situation uh, for those, uh, you know, that opening half of the first period and the game was lost right then and there and, and uh, just sloppiness. I mean, uh, Kulak falling down uh, on on the one goal where Kadri's just sort of coming up at him one-on-one -on -one, and all of a sudden he's got a clear-cut breakaway. And uh, <laughs> bad line change followed by the weak defensive effort by Murray on the 4-1. Uh, but... You know, not, it wasn't pretty. I mean, Michael Stone, not Bobby Orr, Michael Stone, who seems to always score against Edmonton. I mean, he scores from the sideboards about 60 feet out <sighs> off a play, face off play. And it was a great shot right in off the post from distance, but from distance on an angle. And somehow that got through everybody. And, and, oh, the, so. the first goal against, and, and I, I didn't. <clears throat> I thought Holloway bit too hard. Should have been covering the point. Like they're not mm -hmm. going to score from the boards unless it's Michael Stone shooting right. from them, I guess. 
And he he goes, he he leaves his man to come down and bite on the play, which leaves the point shot wide open then. So another rookie mistake from Dylan Holloway. I hate to say it. Yeah. Well, he got the a piece goal. of the point shot and it turned it into about a eight mile an hour knuckleball that somehow yeah. b- bounced and dribbled past RNH. Uh, I think it was Murray or Bouchard yeah, or both in front of the net. Yeah. Nobody could contain it. And uh, uh, Campbell was surprised on it by it. And he punted the rebound right back out into the slot. Like he reacted to it, but he overplayed it. And it instead of controlling a rebound into the corner, right back into the slot it came and right back into the net from the, from uh, there. Yeah, poor Kulak on the on the third goal, Bruce. As I was saying, I just shuddered as it def- like I, I played defense myself in beer league, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm that happens to me probably about once a season. And uh, you know, the, the, he 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 evoked the ghosts of uh, Dennis Grebishkov and Yanni Ninema on that play. Just he is such a fine skater, and for that to happen to him, just to wipe out like that, it is so painful. Anyway, and then the rest is history. Right? They just moved. That was that was Cadre's goal, where he moves in there, right, and he scores, right. So, yeah, Bruce, it was a terrible beginning, and Cam- I thought Campbell should have had that shot from the boards. Frankly, like I just yeah, uh, I did too. I thought he had a, a sight line on it. The yeah. TV commentators were saying he didn't see a thing, and I mean, if there was a flying screen in there, but the one angle, like just when the shot was being fired, I froze the frame on the end zone view. And it seemed like there was a direct line between Campbell and the puck with yeah. Mur- Murray battling a guy just to one side. And certainly there was distractions going on there, but uh, uh, that puck's got to be stopped. Um, on that goal, the, the stone shot, Lucic mm-hmm. did a good job of freezing Malone. Malone should have been out there trying, you know, the winger should be mm-hmm. on that guy. And, and, and Malone got caught up in Lucic uh, in a, you know, in a, in a pick play. Right. So that's half. Good play by Lucic, but bad play by Malone not to, you know, not to get there because you got to get there. You don't want to have a free shot um, from that spot on your net, on the net. Just, just, just a plethora of details. Uh, eh? Just small details, and yeah. they just weren't. Uh, and I have to say, I'm, I'm suddenly fearful <clears throat> of the what I'm seeing from the defensive core. That's yeah, I, you think? I mean, I think they can tighten it up. I, I do think oh. we're going to see Eva Linen. Bruce Fast, um, or Philip Broberry, one or the other. Like we'll see, we'll see. Uh, and and uh, with uh, Nima Line, and we um, we got that. Someone sent us on uh, Twitter like how to pronounce all of the Finnish names correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if Marcus Nima Line was on that, but um, we'll work at that. We'll work on those pronunciations as well. Pulu Yarvi, I think, is the uh, yes, a Pulu Yarvi. All right, Bruce, let's move on to our good things and i'll go first uh my good thing was Stuart skinner mm-hmm. he came in there and they didn't score again and he made a number of fantastic saves particularly on the power play early in the third period um we have five uh we have excuse me we have um four grade a shots and three of them are five alarm shots so a grade a shot goes in 20 plus 20 plus percent of the time Mm -hmm. and a five alarm shot 30 plus percent of the time and um he was in the right place right spot at the right time looked fantastic on that on that uh, penalty kill for the oilers um, stopping a number of point blank um very very difficult shots from the inner slot that were hammered on net so uh Man, it would have been great if they'd seized that momentum that he created for the team and got another goal. But they really didn't um, have a ton of great chances. Evander Kane had a great chance after that from the slot with about 10 minutes, 11 minutes to go. Um, he, um, you know, Nuge kind of did a, a leaping screen through the air. And Kane pounced on a puck and hammered it on net. But other than that... So you get to the very dying seconds. There's not much in the way of dangerous chances for the Oilers in that whole last part of the game after Skinner's momentum changing, should have been momentum changing moment, I think, but didn't really come about, did it? Well, after that great power play by Calgary that they killed off and then Evan got a power play chance of their own and it went absolutely nowhere. And this was when the game was on the line. They needed way more out of that power play, but they couldn't execute a pass or his own entry. Uh, and 
I was pretty convinced that the ice was bad, but you know, that's a, that's a two way street and you got to find ways to get it done, but they just weren't able to, uh, uh, to click on their passes uh, or their uh, quick shots. Uh, and uh, that power play went to waste. And it was one of those games you think, well, I got to four or three with 25 minutes left. There's lots of time, right? And the clock yeah. just keeps going. Oh, yeah. Tick, 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 tick while they're going kind of in circles. And before you know it, they're pulling the goalie and it's still four or three. And... Tick, tick, gloom. All right, um, Bruce, what's your good thing? Well, my good thing is that they somehow were able to get themselves back into the game. A game they had no business being in this game, and it actually went right down to the death, uh, with the Oilers having uh, uh, anywhere between two and 35 <laughs> great looks at the puck from five feet and into the, in the last 10 seconds of play. Dry settle high. Fired a backhand shot. I thought it may it might have been high. Officially, they called a shot on goal that Vlad did, did hit his knob of his the knob of his stick his, on it. Did, yeah. So he made a knob save off of uh, off of Leon, and then th they were able to keep the puck along the boards and work it in front. And like from five seconds down to none, it was like uh, Kane whiffed on it. Uh, Nugent Hopkins whiffed on it, went right to Hyman, right on his forehand in the blue paint. All he had to do was bang it. Somehow he whiffed on a dribbling puck. And by the time he turned and shot at the backhand, that last second had gone away because the puck was moving so slow. And it was like they had several great looks in that in that last couple of seconds. But honestly, I don't think they, they, they deserved a tie out of that game. I think they were the second best team and they got the result that they did reserve, uh, deserve. Uh, that said, it would have been sweet to steal a, a point or even two out of Calgary on a game like that. But like my overriding point about it being a good thing is that this team is good enough that even on a bad night, they have a chance to win. And they proved that tonight because this was a bad night of hockey by the Oilers. And yet still somehow they worked themselves back in the game. They got some goaltending. Uh, unfortunately, a little too little too late, uh, but they got 50 minutes worth of goaltending from Skinner, which you've singled out as your good thing, and and they were able to uh, at least make a game out of it on the scoreboard and uh, and come close. So my good thing is that, uh, that, that this team is good enough that it can make some mistakes disappear with uh, with um, uh, you know just their offensive uh, prowess and. Unfortunately, they, that uh, comeback did run out of steam a little bit in the third period. The grade A shots were uh, 19 to 14 for the Flames, but the Oilers did have the last one, two, three, four, five uh, grade A shots. So 19 to five um, for the uh, for the Flames. So we're moving on to our the numbers. Bruce, my number is eight. That's the number of major mistakes that Cody CC made on grade A shots against. And we've highlighted the worst of them. Mm -hmm. And I can't really think of, I'm not thinking of, you know, his mistakes were fairly mundane. A lot, four of them were on the, on the penalty kill. You're going to make those mistakes on the penalty kill. You're just late to the shooter. You don't, you don't cut out the cross seam pass. Those things will happen to the best of defensive players. It's a pretty rough night though for CC. When he, when you, anytime a defenseman makes, you know, five or up, five or more yeah. major mistakes on grade A shots against, you've had a really rough night. So eight, um, that's, <laughs> that's kind of, he'll be thinking about that. That's kind of a tragic night on the ice. It's not good. And, and um, uh, we didn't see a night like that all last year from CC where I don't think he was uh, picked apart like that. So, you know, he's facing the toughest competition um, that you're going to face in the NHL. He and Darnell Nurse, the way Woodcroft run the, runs those guys, they, they right. face the toughest competition, I think, of any D-men in the NHL. They're out there and uh, against extremely difficult players, offensive players. Now they're out there with really good attackers themselves, but um, they're they. Um, it's a challenge, and sometimes they don't meet it. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they both uh, contributed some key uh, blocks. Yes, yeah, uh, Cece, Cece made a big shot block at the end of that power play after Skinner dealt with the first five grade A shots by Calgary. CC blocked the sixth one. Yes. So is that. And he scored um, a great goal. And yeah, I know. He scored a goal. He had a good hard shot at the other net. 
uh, his troubles and, and the troubles of many in the defense were behind their own blue line and also just in puck distribution. <clears throat> so it was uh, was not a very pretty night for any of the defensemen or really many of the players on the team. What's your number, Bruce? Uh, my number is 636, 636.636, which is the save percentage of Edmonton's new number one goalie, Jack Campbell, in this game. Uh, in his defense, no goalie should face 11 shots in, in 10 minutes. That should be a whole period's worth of shot, not half a period. Uh, however, uh, he only stopped seven of those 11 shots, and two of the seven saves were rebounds that were punted right back into the danger area and quickly converted into goals by Calgary. And it's hard to say, well, geez, you know, he sieved that one and that was a brutal goal or, you know, yeah. but they just needed a save and they just didn't get any saves. I mean, he faced, uh, what do we have him down for? Uh, seven grade A shots. Four of them went in and two of them were those ones that he stopped, but he couldn't control the rebound. So he didn't successfully deal with really any of the problems. And I, I'm, I'm still just finishing up the grades and I'm struggling between a two or a three for Campbell in that, you know, like he didn't do like any really egregious goals, but like I say, he just didn't make any yeah, saves. Yeah, I can what, see a three. Did, yeah, I could so see I, I, my my initial reaction. There. You. Yeah, maybe a three though. I'm I'm right in there, but geez, you know, this is a game where the orders needed to stop, and unfortunately, by the time they did get him, uh, uh, Campbell was on the bench and Skinner was in, but uh, uh, one goal too late, as it turned out, and Skinner really was good, and, and he was the shining star for Edmonton on a night where really. You'd you'd have to search hard to find any Oilers players who were close to their A game in this game. I'd go with a two. Or defenseman. Hmm? In the end, I'd go with a two for Campbell. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, a two. Well, that's where I'm still. Sorry, Jack. Still Campbell. on that fence. I'm at two point five, and my usual, my my usual tiebreaker, David. And I've been doing this for years. Is when I have a half grade, which of course we never award half grades. Is round up for a win, down for a loss. <laughs> I like um, that. I like that rule, the McCurdy it's, rule. It's it's simple, and but it's, you know, on on a night where a you know uh, a uh, you know a single play sometimes can make or break a game, and that magnifies the uh, uh, the importance of the play. You know, be it positive or negative, maybe a single play from that player was a difference maker, and uh, so and it's a results driven business, as you well know. Yeah, um, Bruce, I have a mea culpa uh, to make mm -hmm. based on our last podcast. Right. My bad thing in that podcast was Darnell Nurse's penalty at the end of the first period, mm -hmm. um, which the Canucks later scored on at the start of yes. the second period. And I, I, I um, carved up Nurse for taking a bad penalty out of frustration for no apparent reason. Um, I heard chatter afterwards that he was sticking up for Yessa Pugliarvi, so I went over the videotape, and that's exactly what happened. Pugliarvi, um, Nurse had passed the puck up the boards in their in their own zone to Pugliarvi, and and uh, the de Vancouver defenseman, what's his name, Forty Burrows, Burrows came and cross checked Pugliarvi from behind, mm -hmm. and it was a nasty play, and both so mm -hmm. both Kane first Kane ran Burrows and then Nurse, and it was obvious right. bang bang clear yeah. retaliation, <laughs> and I completely support that, <laughs> right right or wrong. I completely support that, Bruce. You nail uh, a guy with a dirty play, like the dirty cross check from behind on the boards. Good for Darnell Nurse and Evander yeah. King for sticking up for a Yesapulia Yarvi. And mm -hmm. uh, I was wrong to criticize Nurse on that play. It was a missed. I, I had missed that, and it was mystified by the play, but that explained it. So. I remember Pugliarvi getting cross-checked twice in the first period. <clears throat> this after McDavid had taken a cross-check and penalty on the Oilers and sort of going, mm, goose gander, you know, what, what, what are you seeing, ref? But I hadn't taken in, and I still haven't until you mentioned it right now, that it was Burroughs. I do remember the the one of the cross checks on, on Yessa being uh, pretty questionable, and, and I was not pleased that uh, nothing was called. Uh, but I don't mind that, uh, uh, that the Oilers uh, 
uh, uh, power guys go after and deliver a message, which they did in rapid succession. This was a very unusual double hit in that Kane hit him hard and and uh, you know with some edge to his hit, but legally in terms of timing. And then Nurse just followed right in after with the second hit. And the nurse hit was the same as the cane hit, except for the the puck was you know one second further gone off of the guy's stick, and the ref had to call um, had to call it for uh, interference. And it was a good call; I didn't have any problem with the call. I'm a little bit surprised that somehow the league saw fit to nail nurse with a five thousand dollar fine for that nice. hit. And, and I'm I'm trying to get my head around what was the fine for? It was an interference penalty. He took the penalty, he sat down, uh, and uh, Vancouver scored. So, I mean, Edmonton paid a price twice over for that. And I just thought, what's different about that from a million other plays? I mean, did they see it as a headshot? I just, they just said he's fined $5,000 for interference. Whatever. I mean, it's just a yeah. fine. It's not a suspension or anything, but. Uh, it just seemed a little over yeah. the top. Like I've never seen a fine on it. On a, I mean, you don't often see plays quite like that. Usually, a double team hit is where both guys hit the guy simultaneously, not consecutively. But the league was trying to send a message. But uh, reviewing the what the uh, fine was, the message wasn't exactly clear of what they were saying. Was the no go zone? So. Anyway. Now a guy starts making nine million a year, and suddenly everyone wants a little piece of that money. I guess is mm-hmm. yeah. what's going on. Yeah, it's got to go into the players' pension fund. Uh, Five thousand, I think, is what they do with the uh, with <laughs> with the uh, fine money. They don't put it in the swear jar. They put it in the uh, players' pension <laughs> fund. <laughs> well, Bruce, let's leave it there. You got some work to do still tonight, so I'll let you still get out. So. Up. Late night, yeah. Eight o'clock. Right, well, eight o'clock Saturday games are uh, stinkers. Are, are are tough, and they're, they're particularly tough when they end in disappointing losses, like uh, like this one did. Yeah. Edmonton's one home game against Calgary this year, the first time in the history of the uh, Battle of Alberta that the two teams don't play at least two games in each city. And this is now a forty first, forty second year of the Battle of Alberta in the NHL and they've somehow let the, I mean, I know there's more teams, but this formula that they have for building the schedule is flawed. And I, I actually wrote a post about that. I just thought yeah. uh, the league solved this too many teams problem in a, in a fashion that cut into the rivalries, which just a few years ago, they were trying to sell us on the rivalries. And why wouldn't they? Cheaper travel, shorter road trips, uh, greater rivalries, bigger chances of sellouts, bigger chances of great concession sales. I mean, they should be pushing the hell out of those games. So here we are, October 15th, six months to go in the season, and the next time we might see Calgary is in the playoffs. Indeed. I Bruce, have to play them tomorrow after that game and take it to them, you know. Yeah. So it's a lot of weight. Thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.